It comes to myself, uh, witnesses. I do appreciate we're like hours into this and you're probably tired and exhausted. So I will try to be as um, short as possible. Um, Mr. Coveney, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to the toy show, okay? And I appreciate it's difficult. I appreciate you put your hand up and said it wasn't the success you had hoped it to be. But can I explore it a little bit more in terms of your um, planning for it, let's just say? Was it always to be, let's just say, the convention centre, we all know it's a very expensive um, venue to hire in the first place. Was there any consideration given to any other venues within Dublin City around this? Yeah, we looked at a couple of different venues. Um, they were similar size. We had discussions with the Port Gash at one stage. Um, they, they, they didn't want to do it, um, we, and we ended up in the convention centre. Yeah, there's, not, there's not that many venues in, in Dublin that, that aren't owned by... by you know, by certain um, proprietors. So um, it, it's not that easy just to go and pick a theatre. I'm not, I mean, yeah. might be able to give more insight into that. But um, so, so no, we, we, we ended up in the convention centre. Um, we, we felt it was it was it was the right size for the type of show we wanted to put on. Um, but obviously, we were we were incorrect. But um, yeah. Okay. Can Did I you? ask you, with the team, your creative team that was considering this and planning it and all the rest, was there any consideration <coughs> given to the fact of the impact this might have on the more traditional pantos and musicals that we all have been going to for years as kids and, and as parents too? Was there any consideration to the impact, the commercial impact that might have on them? Well, look, we didn't set out... We, we set out to, to create an alternative to the big Broadway shows that were coming to Dublin, the international shows that were coming to the Borgash, to create something as of that scale and size and ambition in Dublin that was, was about, about Ireland, about our culture, about our communities, rooted in the biggest TV property we have, which is the toy show, um, sent with children front and centre in it, and can create something new and unique. Um, it was... The, the Pantos is, is it just a different business. It's a different, it's a different market. And um, as I said, we were, we were trying to compete with, um, I think the Beauty and the Beast was on, but we, um, and those, inter, those big international shows. So it was trying to create something of that scale and ambition. Okay. Um, well, just to answer my question, was there any consideration given to, because the timing of it obviously does clash, and I was at it, by the way, um, it does clash with a lot of other pantos and musicals around the city centre. Was there any consideration? Because at the time, I do remember there was a lot of discussion in the public domain around the impact this was having on the livelihood of artists and creators and makers and producers that have been at this for years. I, to just to say, I mean, we, we employed about 100 people during the show. We, we employed um, all those, a lot of those same people. We had, we had a cast of 34 children, 16, 16 adults. We had a whole team of technicians and musicians. Um, but they um, obviously came from somewhere else, like you were just no, displacing they were, they were, them. They were, they were all Irish, um, virtually. And there's a one or two, a few international ones, but mo most of them were Irish. No, what I mean is they must have come from other theatre sets or crews or whatever, like you were displacing somewhere else to, yeah, but to we, put this bear, on. Bear in mind, at the time we were coming out of COVID, a lot of, a lot of these professionals hadn't worked for a couple of years at this stage. Yeah. You know, and we're hugely grateful to be given an opportunity to work on something of this ambition and scale in Dublin, okay. which is, which is So I, I'll go back to my, my question. Was there any consideration given to the impact this might have on the creative industry? Industries already in place and doing more. I know you'll, you'll say you're the musical, but the pantos, we all sort of attend those at Christmas time and in the new year. Was there any consideration given to the impact? If I'm honest, Deputy, yeah, of course we would have considered what the competition would be, but ultimately we thought this was additive. This was adding to the, the, the creative sector, adding to the, the opportunities for, for all the talent that was involved. And, the, and Dublin's a big city. There's was, there was lots of shows on. They're all there, everyone's competing um, for, for, for audiences. Um, Did so you not think to yourself, perhaps there's enough of this? Hmm? Did you never think to yourself, or was it never discussed that there's enough of this happening already? We're just but I think it's very different. I mean, it depends on your perspective whether, whether this is the same as Panto or not. I mean, that this is a very different production um, to, to, to pantomimes. You know, it, it's so. You know, and the timing was, in one sense, is dictated by the toy show. You know, the toy show is the, the story was about the toy show. You know, um, um, I mean, if if we ever bring this back. You know, I think there there is consideration about timing whether we go before the toy show rather than after it. Yeah. Well, if you were to run it again, would you still do it in the convention centre? No, I think we go for a smaller theatre if we were doing it again. Yeah, I mean, one of the problems we had with the size of theatre with hindsight was we couldn't get to sell, couldn't get to sell out, um, and we couldn't build momentum, we couldn't build scarcity, we couldn't build excitement around a demand. Um, so, can I ask you, how did you get rid of nine thousand free tickets? We had a whole series of, of, of outreach opportunities. So we had um, a toy show appeal, um, families and guests from all over the country was, was, for, was for a charity night. We had 
A, we did an initiative for deaf schools around the, in the 10 deaf schools in the Dublin 1, Dublin 2 area. We had about 1,600 kids came through that. We had um, all our contractual obligations, all the cast and crew and their families, um, which are, that they were, they were um, and we did a special on, on, on Christmas Eve. Would you agree with, with me that they families. are eye watery numbers to think of? And, and I come from somebody who's worked in a much smaller theatre. The, the idea yeah, that 9,000 bums on seats were free is an eye-watering figure, almost the same amount of people who paid for actual tickets. Yeah, I think, in fairness, they, it looks worse because of what happened. Um, we had a huge huge number of sales, as I said, 6,700 sales on the, that big weekend that got cancelled. Um, and our, that was our, probably our last chance to kick in, into momentum into Christmas, and we lost all momentum. Um, when not only did we have um, lose positive sentiment, we'd act with negative sentiment, given that people had travelled from the country and so on, to, um, and we'd, we'd cancel shows in, 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 a, in a, a very late notice. So, so you know, that, that's when, when when the project really took a took a, a turn, and we lost a lot of demand then into the into the two Christmas weeks. Well, I, I actually think, to be honest, if you know, you raise your hand and say this didn't work out, we won't be doing it again. People could accept that better, but I think there has been a lot of discussion. And maybe no, I mean, uh, the, the, the reason, sorry, just definitely, the reason I say we haven't made a definitive decision on whether we do it again, we have created something, and we have, and we have real creative assets and IP. We have songs, we have, we have beautiful music, we have story, we have set. Um, you know, so I'm not, I'm not saying we, we'll, we necessarily, it'll be the same again, but there's a lot of assets that could be repurposed and, and reused again, which have value. So. Can I ask you what you meant by the um, comment you made there, that there was no material difference to those type of losses to Storty? Well, look, it, they, they were... They were netted off in our accounts, you know, and, and our end of year accounts, which will be published so soon, will we'll, we'll catch it, will capture that. So I'm not saying it's, it, as I said, I'm not Can saying. Can I ask you to put it in another way? The staff who have been out very vocally and publicly <coughs> saying that they couldn't get crews to go here and there, that they couldn't, they were working with broken equipment and that. Do you think they'd agree with that comment? Well, I'd say, deputies, we have to try things. I, I no, no, totally I mean, appreciate I know, I, that, I mean, but to I, say the two point something million made no material difference to RT, I would have to categorically disagree with you on that. No, of course it made a difference. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, though, we, we, we have to try new things. We have to d d d diversify our commercial incomes. We have to take risks. And, I, I, um, you know, and unless we do, we're, we're, in, we're in a declining ad advertising market, unless we can generate new, new businesses and new, new ideas from our, from our talent and our staff. I mean, okay, and I have one final question for you, Mr. Colby. It has been um, alluded to by my colleague, um, Christopher O'Sullivan. Ryan Tuberty wasn't involved. Was he supportive of the idea? Yeah, I mean, he was supportive. Yeah, I okay. mean, um, yes, he was. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. I am now going to ask uh, Mr. Lynch just a question. If you could talk us through the process. So we have moved, Ryan Tuberty has um, said his goodbyes and we're moving on to a new phase for the Late Late Show. Um, could you talk us through the process of deciding who that host should be? Yeah, in terms of that process, uh, so there was a long list, then there was a shorter list. Did they apply or how does that come about? No, that is, uh, so no, uh, that is um, actually literally a list of people who could be suitable. So okay, there is, can I ask there is you who, no, who draws up that list? That is uh, drawn up by the director of content. By so the director of content. It is the director and can of I ask you how many DGs. names would have been on that list? In terms of the long list, I'd say there's about 20 names. Okay. Would those 20 people have been aware that their names were on the list for potential hosts of the Late Late Show? And not necessarily. Not Some necessarily. would, but not many. No. Actually, I would say hardly any at all. Okay. In fact. Yeah. Would people and entertainers and people in that business be in a position to apply and uh, demonstrate their interest in that position? And no, it wasn't an open application. Given the size of the show and everything like that, you need significant broadcasting experience in terms of carrying that. So it wasn't an open call. Definitely. So if anybody did uh, declare to RTE that they were interested and interested in that position, would they have necessarily got any information or feedback as to why they hadn't been considered? Uh, in terms of that, um, no, because it wasn't an open process with formal feedback that you might have in the case of, for example, if you're commissioning programs, there's an entire commissioning system that's set up and the program. And just to finish off on that piece, so what we're saying is it's a list of roughly 20 and that list is drawn up by the head of content. Correct. 
Okay. And from where does it go? Does it go across the executive to make that ultimate decision, or how is that decision made? So the director of content is responsible for the editorial output from the content division. The director of news and current affairs is responsible for the output from news and current affairs. So it is their decision in tandem with the DG. Okay. And uh, we, as a committee, have asked questions around uh, Mr. Keelty's contract, and we've got furnished with some details around that. Can I ask you, who is going to, is the, the person, and I don't know who that is, the, the professional who directed the previous Late Late Show, going to continue in that role for the next phase of the Late Late Show? That doesn't sit within my division. What I do know is that uh, my understanding, and I don't know if they've confirmed it, is that a certain individual who has worked with Mr. Keelty before is going to be directing that. Uh, the individual who would have directed uh, Ryan Tuberty last year is doing a set of other things. One is a key uh, event that we're doing. So can um, I ask, has that new, so we're saying that whoever directed the Late Late Show in the past, is no lo their services is no longer required. We're bringing in a new director along with Patrick Keelty to direct the new Late Late Show, am I right? That's correct. Just okay. to explain the person. And can I just, who, I just, because I have such a short time, I'm okay, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, that person. <laughs> <laughs> that person, would they, uh, are, are they, are they, they're obviously incurring new costs. Is that a contra contractual? Uh, I would say, in terms of multi camera direction, and particularly in terms of big LNE shows, there is a limited pool because actually in Ireland we don't do that many of those type of shows. Mm -hmm. For example, something like Dance with the Stars, there is a UK director who comes in to do that, who has the necessary skill set to deliver something as complex. We have a brilliant director who is an RT staff member who is going on to do a significant uh, cultural event we're doing with the government to close the decade of centenaries. So he's Were going they happy to, to be leaving <coughs> the Late Late Show? I've never had a conversation with that individual. I do know that the, the job and project that they're taking on is incredibly exciting, and uh, they're a perfect person for it. Okay. Moya, you talked about being on the corridors of um, RTE. Can I ask you, did you ever hear the comment that Noel Kelly was the real DG around RTE? I did not ever hear that comment until I saw it written recently, and I don't believe it to be true. Um, I think his role um, in representing agents is clear, I think the importance that he has been given um, is maybe uh, extreme. I think that the negotiating process could have been more robust on the part of RTE. Um, however, and I think this is important to say because you were raising a chair and I know it was in, in relation to what Adrian was saying and Rory was saying, not everybody can do the job that is required there is such a thing called charisma, and there is such a thing Which called... Which job do you mean then? Well, I mean a job of presenter within yeah. RTE. Yeah, yeah. The audience, in a world of dual funding um, public service media, the audience follows the people they like. Mm -hmm. Then the advertisers follow the audience. Okay. Can I just bring you back to the Noel Kelly piece? There is a certain perspective and rightly or wrong that Noel Kelly's influence on all of the entertainers and many of the presenters within RTE that he yielded too much um, influence let's just say. I um, I really don't know anything about the influence okay. that he yielded other than he represented individuals and clearly represented them very well. Would you say that that has been to the detriment of RTE in terms of what has cost them? I believe that, um, and this is probably going to go contrary to most people's views, but I believe that people who have talent and charisma, if they so choose, are entitled to representation. However, I'm, that I'm may change. I'm going to go back to my question, okay? Do you think in the case of our public service broadcaster, it has been to the detriment of RTE that one particular contractor has so many of the presenters and the top presenters that RTE has that it he's is representing not, it, them? Absolutely, Chair. It is not as it should be. Okay, thank you. Miss um, O'Leary, I have just one request really more than anything else, and it's around Soho House, and that's because that's kind of new information that we received late last night. I'm wondering if you could furnish the committee with a full inventory of who uh, would have 
been in, 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 in uh, Soho House um, and what meetings were held there over the, since 2019, I think it is, and since the contract was Certainly. renewed. Certainly. Is that okay? And that comes to the end of my uh, lines of questions. Just to say thank you very much for your cooperation today. You have, I know it's been not just a difficult day, it's been a difficult couple of weeks. And I hope you feel you've been treated fairly and respectfully at all times. It has been my utmost uh, priority to do that for, for everybody. Uh, I